Egunon, aize ondo entzuten da. Good morning. We're just going to uh, take some photos. Professor Strickland, or Strickland is, uh, has just arrived. We have uh, Professor Smoot there as well. Pedro Miguel Echenique. So we're just taking some photos. Don't look at me. Don't look at me. Look at the camera. It's much more important. Venga, Gora, Gora Biotak, Al Chadanak. Okay, everybody up. Put your hands up. Venga, Escua Gora. I mean, everyone with the hands up. Hands up. Oh, son no. Saria da Gogaña, eh? The prize, you're not going to get a prize for putting your hands up, but there is a prize. Oh, no. Oh, no. Chaloca, no iba de suerte. Now, a warm round of applause, please, to kick the session off. Seondo, gente. Seondo. Rudeo. Escogerá. Egun on berriz. So, good morning again, everyone. I think it's probably about time to start. You're all here. Thank you very much for coming here. Thank you to all of you. So, before we formally start today's event, let me just tell you that you've been given headphones for simultaneous interpreting. Spanish is channel one, English is channel two, and Basque is channel three. She's just repeating that now in Spanish. Translating everything that is going to happen. Uh, there will be Spanish in channel one, English in channel two, and Basque in channel three. So, as I was saying, thank you very much for being here. Es que recasco, Thank you all very much. Thank you for, to the uh, representatives of the institutions and obviously our Nobel laureates. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you to all the students as well and other technicians. Now, this is the 12th time uh, we've been holding this festival. We've got a whole week ahead of us full of passion, passion for knowledge. We started yesterday in San Sebastian where we heard a presentation given by Donna Strickland, and also we heard yesterday from Oslem Durekti. So there's all sorts of things going on this week. We've got Nauka sessions, streamer sessions. We've got uh, a Basque extempore verse singing session as well happening. There's uh, an astronomy exhibition. There's all sorts of things going on. And today we're here with you, with the students, and you are the main figures in today's event. There are more than 180 students here today. So if each of you have uh, sent in three questions, you can imagine how many questions we have today for our guests. Let me just explain how today's going to go. So we're here in, in a venue called the Bizkaya Aretua. Uh, we'll be hearing from some of the official representatives who are going to give us some words of introduction. Then we'll have questions. The questions will be chosen by means of a draw, questions and answers. Then there will be a break for a cup of coffee or a sandwich, and you will have uh, a chance to actually talk to Professor Strickland and Professor Smoot as well. Pleasure for me, and I believe that I can say that it is for everyone to have you here, and we are honored that you can take your time to share it with our wonderful and future scientists. Okay. Uh, 
But of course, this wouldn't have been possible without our sponsors, both public institutions and private companies who have collaborated with the DIPC. And in fact, we are here in a venue that belongs to one of the sponsors, the University of the Basque Country, in this particular case. We have Eva Ferreira, who is the Vice Chancellor of the University of the Basque Country, and she's here with us today. She's just going to say a few words of welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, President of the Denostia International Physics Center, Mr. Director of the uh, DIPC, Director General of Telefonica, Professor Strickland, uh, Professor Smoot, ladies and gentlemen, students, friends, welcome, welcome all of you to this uh, Top Paqueta session. Welcome to this new event of the Passion for Knowledge Festival, organized by the Donostia International Physics Center, especially aimed at young students as you. I would like to express the satisfaction of our university, which is the only university that is part of this team of Donosti International Physics Center for hosting this meeting. Passion for Knowledge is a project with international relevance awakening scientific vocation among young people and increasing social interest in science. Yesterday, a new edition of this passion began in San Sebastián, and we are happy to host the activities today here in Bilbao, in our house in the University of the Basque Country. Orainche Bertan, Goimayako Iru Ciencia. So we have three. So we have uh, three renowned uh, scientists with us this morning. We have Pedro Miguel Echenique, we have Professor Donald, and two uh, renowned scientists. And I wish you the great stay here in the Basque Country, and particularly today here in Bilbao. So they know much better than me, uh, how important this event is and events of this type are. The aim of an event is to excite curiosity and passion for knowledge among young people. Knowledge and science is an exciting journey. And it's an exciting journey that many people have taken before us. We're not the first. And it's wonderful to have the presence of experts here today and have the opportunity to ask them questions. So today is an unbeatable opportunity to learn more about science. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to be able to get to know these leading figures in science. When Pedro Miguel Etienne came up with the idea uh, for Passion for Knowledge, uh, he got it right. I think he hit the nail on the head. And he got the name right as well, because we're talking about passion. And passion and reason are not the same thing. But I can tell you that at least in the world of science, passion and curiosity are closely linked to reason. So now and in life in general, follow your passions, all of you. Follow your passions and use reason as well. So follow your passion, follow your vocation, but, uh, and that with a healthy dose of hard work. And if you do that, the future is yours. So thank you all very much for being here today. Thank you to people, institutions, all of you who have made this possible. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Ferreira, I totally agree with you, and thank you very much for your uh, very wise words. Now we have Javier Benito, who is the director for the Basque arm of uh, Telefonica. Telefonica is a, a local mobile communications company here, and in fact they're going to be giving a prize for the best question. So if you'd like to come up here uh, and say a few words, thank you very much. Bueno, eh... Right, good morning everyone. George and Donna, 
Page, eh, Pedro y Ricardo y resto del IPC, muchas gracias por Pedro and company, thank you very much for inviting us once more to come here and uh, be at this event as sponsors. Eva, thank you very much for coming as well. Today is a great day. It's a really good day. Now, I know that uh, at school, uh, you've only been back at school for a couple of weeks, but uh, for those few weeks, you have been studying uh, what George and Donna have been doing and their scientific achievements and studies. But it's not every day that you get two Nobel laureates and winners of the Princess of Asturias Prize, uh, you know, spending a couple of hours of their very busy lives and their very busy schedules to come and talk to you, uh, secondary school students. I mean, it's a fantastic opportunity for all of you, and I'm delighted to be here as well because I can learn. I learn so much. I learn not just from them. I also learn from you, students. I learn from your questions, uh, and it's wonderful to see your enthusiasm for all of this as well. Now, I'm sure... Uh, many of you are saying, well, what on earth is Telefonica doing here today? I mean, what's telephones got to do with all of this? I'll try and explain in just 30 seconds. We have, obviously, with us uh, Donna, George and Pedro, because they're going to be talking, and it's much more interesting to listen to what they're going to say. But let me just say that science is the origin of almost everything. And as Telefonica, um, we're going to be celebrating our 100th anniversary soon in the world of science and technology and we wouldn't exist unless we followed technology really really closely and science really really closely so since the dipc was set up we've been there with them every step of the way uh supporting science uh scientific outreach programs uh, and in the basque country uh what better place to do that than with the donostia international physics center we have been with them right from the very beginning so we're a technological company, we're talking about 5G and fiber optics and all the rest of it. Yes, okay, this is what we do, but we can only do that because science and technology uh, move forward thanks to scientists. And this enables us to provide you with a better service. So we would be nothing uh, unless we were closely linked to science and technology every step of the way. So that's all from me. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you for making this effort. And uh, enjoy. Thank you very much, Mr. Benito. Right, let me just explain to you how things are going to work. So we received all your questions that you sent in. They're all there on a list. You've got a list in front of you and there will be a draw. There will be a draw and the questions that come out of the draw, uh, we will be asking our guests. We'll try to make sure that they're not repeated too much uh, and that it's a, a good even distribution of the questions to our different guests. So please don't, uh, please make the most of this opportunity because it's very rare. You probably never ever in this, be in the same room as two Nobel laureates ever again. You never know, but it's very unlikely. So please make the most of it. So the system's really simple. As I said, as we can see. So let's have a look. I'm gonna just start the draw. Here we go. Let's get going. So here we are. We have three types of questions. We have biographical questions, uh, scientific technical questions, and we have general questions. So you could choose what type of question you wanted to ask. And you can ask the question to Professor Strickland or to Professor Smoot, either one or both. Uh, Pedro will chair the session and uh, he will try to make sure that everything runs smoothly. I will be just pressing the button to uh, choose a question, we'll see the question, uh, we will sh tell you what school sent in the question and what the question is, but we will be giving you the microphone and you will have to stand up and ask the question. It's a pleasure, I have to say, for me to be here and uh, uh, please, uh, Pedro Miguel Echenique, could you come up to the stage? It's wonderful to see you. Also, Professor George Smoot, would you please come up to the stage? And Professor Donna Strickland as well. All three of you, if you could come up 
to the stage and we will greet them with a very, very warm round of applause. Pedro Surea Itza. Pedro, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much to all three of you, of course. Just a few words, um, but we need Pedro Miguel Echenique to use a mic, otherwise we won't be able to translate um, from the booth. Um, I feel like at home here. I am a member of the University of Basque Country. I've always felt and very proud of uh, being a professor at this University of the Basque Country. I'd like to thank Telefonica uh, for their support. I'm a shareholder myself and uh, so, uh, very often I look at the price of the shares and I wonder why they don't, don't go up. <laughs> But well, you know, um, Telefonica has always supported DIPC because they understand that a competitive company needs a competitive environment as well. So, uh, shall we now introduce our guests? Pablo Pedro. Ah, sí. Bueno. Pero. Bueno, pues entonces. Pero una, tienes chuleta. Muy brevemente, como tenemos. Be very briefly introduce you to both our guests uh, because we really want to focus on questions today and there are many of many questions to be asked um, you know uh, both uh, Nobel laureate we have here and uh, you know it's very hard it's not really hard to introduce them really easy donor Steve Land is a uh, um, got the uh, Nobel uh, physics prize and um, we also have a second uh, Nobel laureate here with us, um, Mr. S uh, Professor Smooth got the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2006. Kansas, and your English, your beautiful English, uh, will be better understood if it is spoken slowly. <laughs> you are Thank you very much. Perfect. I completely agree, Pedro. So, as you say, let's begin. Shall we start with a biographical, um, scientific, technical, or general question? Biographical question. To begin with, I feel like a, a Christmas draw, right? Now I need some technical support. Because it says here, I need to log in. Can someone help me, please? No, no, os digo en serio que lo hemos probado ocho veces, no una ni dos. We've already been testing this this morning like eight times, but you know this proves that science is what a parent teaches uh, their children and technology what the children teach to the parents, you know, what they teach their parents, um, that's uh, technology. Is it alright? Is it working now? Yes, we're ready. Biographical question. And the number is number 20 from Santa Maria. Um, school in Portugalete. So this is a question. This is a question for Professor Donna Strickland. Did you know from a very young age that you were going to work in this field or on the contrary did something make you change direction, study physics and research lasers? Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> it's very loud. Uh, let me take this out. Um, so when I was in high school, I probably would have said I was going to do math because I was very good at math and I, I just found it a lot of fun. But I was very shy. And my sister and best friend went to the University of Waterloo, which is where I am now, and it's the best place for uh, math. So I said, I have to go somewhere where nobody knows me. So I thought I won't do math because I'm not going to Waterloo. And so then I had, uh, physics was my second choice. And I chose to go to McMaster and it had a part that was lasers and electro-optics in the engineering physics program. And it just struck me as something really fun to do. So I knew from 18, this is what I would do. Great.
Another one. Another sí. biographic. Another for you. Hacemos una biográfica a ver si le toca a George. Or no? Another biographical question for George, maybe. Maybe he can also answer in the same line, no? Just pick it random. <laughs> random. You rather have a random one? Okay, let's go. Otra bio biográfica, venga. Another biographical one, number 38. Portugal. This is from a young tea school in Portugalete. Where everyone is happy. Hi, <laughs> but um, did you know since you were in high school student that you wanted to study at college or what you wanted to do for a living? Thank you for your question. Uh, the answer is no, I didn't know. I knew I wanted to study and learn more about the world and learn how things work and learn, you know, just the way things were. And I, that was my primary motivation. It's still my motivation. <laughs> yeah, I kept it short. <laughs> okay. okay we're going to change now and we're going to go to scientific and technique questions. That belongs from Colegio San Pelayo School in Hermoa. You will win the Nobel, no sé, the Nobel we... Prize for the research in laser technology. Did you imagine the possible application while you were developing in laser technology? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> we knew at the time it was going to be very important for our field of high intensity laser physics. Um, we were not trying to do the applications that have now come out, which is for the eyes and, and for uh, machining glass. We had no idea about that. And um, I will also say that it, it, at the same time we were doing our work, somebody at a different institute was coming up with a new type of laser crystal. And it was the combination of these two things that made it really big. So and I, we couldn't have imagined that. Let's go for a scientific technical question, 137. This is a question from Laudio School for Professor George Smoot. Yeah, here goes the question. Let's wait for a few seconds. Someone will stand up and ask the question, all right, from the floor. Can you hear translation all right? Okay. So what do you think about the possibility of life existing outside planet Earth? Un poco más lento las preguntas, por favor. Can you ask questions a little bit uh, slower, please? Can you say it again? Yeah, the question is, what do you think about the possibility of life uh, outside planet Earth? Okay, I think about it a lot. I've been involved in SETI for more years than you have been alive. <laughs> and uh, uh, so it's actually a good question because we're finally getting to the point where we're beginning to have evidence that life may exist on other planets. So one of the people that I'm working with at the IPC, we're involved in a project with the James Webb Space Telescope. And James Webb Telescope recently found the spectrum of a planet that had in it chemicals that are chemicals that on Earth only life forms make. So we're getting hints. We know roughly half the stars have planets around them. We know that means there's more than 100 billion planets in the, solar, in the galaxy. And we know that a good fraction of those are in what we call a habitable zone. So we know the conditions that make life good for it exist in a large number of places in our galaxy, and there are billions of galaxies. And so the chances of life seem to be enough, but given the kind of hints we're getting from seeing other planets, life might be fairly common. So I believe that in your lifetime, not so many years from now, 
we're going to have a lot of direct evidence for life and other solar systems. La presentación ha sido tan Yes. My introduction was very short, and I forgot to say something important. Uh, Professor Smoot devotes 20% of her, her, his time at the Donatia International Physics Center in San, San Sebastian. También. With Professor Strickland will also <laughs> will join us. <laughs> so, thank you very much. So, to have a Nobel Prize is not enough. It's also working in diabetes. Nice Next try, one. Pedro. <laughs> okay. Eh, vamos con una general. Let's now ask a general question. 71. Number 71. From Mendevaldea School in Vitoria Gasteiz. Are you there somewhere? Yes, there you are. Many people's goal is to achieve great things, but once you win the Nobel Prize, do you feel like you have achieved your life's purpose or do you have uh, some other goals? Who she asking? <laughs> go for it. No, you go for it. Oh, I see. Um, for both of you. Okay. Oh, yes. So, it's been the policy that once you get one Nobel Prize, you don't get another now because there are more things that are worth a Nobel Prize than there are Nobel Prizes to give out. And so it's very rare to get a second prize, but it doesn't mean that some of us don't want to keep knowing. In my case, there are some questions I want to know the answers to. I keep doing research, I keep doing that stuff. And I also want to pass down the enterprise of science to the next generation in a, as good a form as I got it. And so you don't stop, and I have many colleagues that don't stop. Some are continuing to drive. One of the Nobel laureates that's here with us, he complains that he's dragged out to too many talks because he's got research he wants to get done before he dies. So the answer is, for many Nobel laureates, they think there's more they need to do and I want to do. Yes. I would just add, I did not have the goal to win a Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. uh, I just really wanted to uh, have a job that I found fun. And so uh, I really do like playing with my lasers and I still wish I had time to play with my lasers. And, but I also think that when we are given the Nobel Prize, we are given a voice and this is why we are the ones invited to things like this. And it's, I think it's important um, for the public in general to understand the impact of science on society and so I think this is why we uh, take on this role which means there's less time for our science. I want to, I want to say another thing and I'm looking at the, the, the uh, eminent person from Telefonica. There are many things you do as a Nobel laureate. You get call not only to have a voice in the public but also have a voice in the, in the private sector. Uh, on boards and on other things. I found, by surprise, myself on the board of quantum communications uh, thing that was going on, which was a surprise to me, apparently eventually to the Chinese government. But in fact, you might know there have been a Chinese satellite that does quantum communications from the ground, one place on the ground to another place on the ground, and also from on the ground to Austria. And it is part of what we see happening in the telephone business in the future that there will be quantum <coughs> communications for the internet and for the telephone calls as a way to improve the quality and the security of the systems. And in fact, that progress is going on in a great way. So you're called not only to talk about your expertise, but to, to be called for advice in other areas. It's quite a surprising extra opportunity or burden you might have. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting points. Two small things. First, uh, our 
telephonica company that is supporting the IPC has one of the most eminent quantum physicists in the world, in the board, in the board of trustees, that will be speaking, in fact, I think this afternoon in San Sebastian, Ignacio Cirac. Y otra cosa, como dato, creo que solo hay una persona. And there's only one person who has actually won the Nobel Prize for Physics twice. I think they won it once for uh, chemistry and physics. That was Madame, Madame Marie Curie. And, but in physics, I think there's only one person who's won the Nobel Prize twice. Uh, it doesn't mean that there are many others who, who shouldn't have won. There are many, many people who should have won the prize. John Bardi, for example, he won in 56 for the transistor and in, uh, I think, 72 for superconductivity. There we go. Just a piece of information for you there. A bit of, bit, bit of trivia for you. Un dato muy interesante y el profesor Smooth me ha comentado antes que hoy se le entrega el premio Nobel. Some very interesting information because the Nobel uh, winner is being decided right now, uh, and uh, we'll know more about that later on. Yeah, the direct DIPC director will tell us about that later on about who wins the Nobel Prize of Physics this year. Okay, question number sixty-four now. A biographical question coming from the Minas School in Baracaldo. This is for Professor Smoot. So why are you interested in microwaves and their relationship with the creation of the universe? Okay, so this is an interesting question. Una pregunta muy interesante. Yo no estaba interesado en microondas, de hecho. Pero claro, el universo está en expansión y la luz, que brillaba mucho, mucho más que el sol, por la expansión del universo, ahora mismo está en el espectro de las microondas. Eh, está expandiendo muy rápidamente el universo. Entonces, para poder estudiar el comienzo del universo y utilizar la luz del comienzo. Microwaves. So, I was interested in the microwaves because that's where the light in the universe is from. Was in una horrera de more de merrier. Let's now ask a scientific technical question. Number 13, from the Miguel de Unamuno uh, School in Bilbao. Again, a question for Professor Smoot. How has anisotropy influenced the development of the Big Bang Theory? Okay, this is interesting. Interesting enough, the DIPC has asked me to give a talk about this on Saturday. But the first information you have is that the universe essentially is a uniform glow like it was a perfect sun, more perfect than our own sun. Our own sun has spots on it. But the universe is much smoother and much more uniform than that. But after many years, my team, we were able to show there were variations, the small angular variations, because we're looking out from the Earth, it's called anisotropies, that they were variations at about a part in 100,000. That's smoother than a billiard ball. But those are the things that represent, we believe, the quantum mechanical fluctuations when space and time itself were being created. And it leaves behind these small variations that become galaxies or clusters of galaxies also breaks down to things like, you know, clusters of star stars and even individual solar systems. So it's not, a, it's not influencing the development of the Earth. The universe made it. Those tiny imperfections in the universe are the things that make the universe really interesting to us and make the stage possible. 
Without them, there wouldn't be a stage, there wouldn't be the material to make the stage. Question number 32 from San Adrián School in Bilbao. This question is for Professor Strickland. What projects do you have in mind for the future? Um, so, I have a few. <laughs> I still try to make uh, pulses shorter, but uh, I'll tell you the one I'm starting with a colleague, uh, Toshi Tajima. He is the inventor of laser acceleration. And um, now the biggest lasers in the world, or the most powerful lasers in the world, are working uh, to make particles accelerate to high energies. But he wants to have them not so high, and so I just have small fiber lasers in my lab. And we're going to try to put a laser accelerator at the end of a fiber that can go down into the body and radiate uh, what's left of a tumor after a surgeon has taken most of it away. So that's the overall goal, and my part is just the laser and, and fiber delivery part of it, but that's one of the things we're working on. Wow. One more question, number 15 now, a general question. From Miguel de Unamuno School in Bilbao. This is a question for both, and maybe for you too, uh, Pedro, why not? In four or five years' time, when we finish our degree, what will be the main challenge in terms of research and work in the field of physics? You want to begin, or you, who begins? You. I would, I would say, hopefully, we don't know. Um, I think science changes. I also think that we have too much of a habit of jumping on bandwagons, and so I would like to think that there's more than one big challenge, but uh, George may disagree with me. Um, I think it, it's amazing to me still that uh, we don't know that much about quantum mechanics, in, that we've been studying it for 100 years and it's having a resurgence again, uh, and it's still about the fact that is it a particle, is it a wave, we don't know, and how does that entanglement um, help us? So the answer is you keep your view open when you finish the experiment you're doing. For example, I'm doing a project with colleagues from, G, from my colleagues at DIPC and actually from the a student from the university here and our colleagues in Hong Kong, but a bigger team. We're using the James Webb Telescope to look at clusters of galaxies that will work as a double lens. There's the JWST huge telescope and then there's a great galaxy, cluster of galaxies and it's lensing far away earliest galaxies to try and see what happened at the beginning of the universe. That the project is gonna go on for a while. It's very active now, but it will go on for some time periods, probably by the time, you know, to the time you're in that is cool. And there'll be more like that. However, like Donna, I believe new questions will come up. So we have this thing that I call ignorance. So there's the part we know and right near what we know is our ignorance. Uh, here is stuff we don't even know we don't know. So our ignorance is growing all the time because our knowledge is growing, right? But what's even further out, we don't know. So there, there, science hasn't had an end to its story yet. You know, we can hope, some of us hope we can get a theory of everything, but that's probably not likely. There's probably gonna be a lot more to be done for quite some time. And it's good because it makes our life richer. You know, you guys don't know this, but it wasn't that long ago we didn't have smartphones and stuff that we carried around in our pocket. <laughs> Times are changing. It's like at the beginning with the, the, we have to conserve energy. We now have to conserve our ignorance. 
because it, our, un, our, our unaware ignorance becomes aware ignorance. In circus, when this, the circle of knowing is small, the unknown is also small surrounding it. When you increase it, it increases. So the biggest contribution of knowledge is increased ignorance. Yes. A smooth principle. <laughs> Bibliography. Ori, Perfect. Ipinza Number 35 from Ipinza School. And it's a question for Donna Strickland. Uh, has being a woman opened doors for you in your career, or has it closed them? Okay. Um, I actually, I always uh, am an optimistic person, so I always see the good. And I remember when I was an undergraduate uh, doing a research project, and I spent the whole summer trying to make this little diode, right? I had to start by actually uh, taking apart the vacuum chamber and cleaning it all, and it took the whole summer. And then it was in my hand in tweezers, and it fell on the floor. And it fell on the floor where everybody soldered. So my little diode looked the same as all the drops of solder. So I, I thought, I've spent my whole summer. I must find this thing and, and test it. And so I got down on my hands and knees and looked at each of these little pieces. And one by one, the male, I was the only female in the group, and one by one, the male grad students came, asked what I was doing. They all got down on their knees and helped me. And I thought, hmm, I wonder if I was a male undergrad, if they would all help me. Probably not. <laughs> and we found it with everybody looking. So I always think that I've been helped uh, far more than I've been hurt by being a female. Should we carry on with the scientific technical question? So, question number 78 from Thumaya Secondary School in Thumaya. And it's a question for both our guests. And the question is, has studying physics helped us understand our world better? Both. Both. Yes. It's, do you fly on a magic carpet? <laughs> do you fly on an airplane? Which one's physics, which one's magic? Hmm. Right? Does understanding physics make, so we have bridges, engineers do that, so that we have, you know, now microsurgery, we can have, we're gonna have quantum communications, we're gonna have everything. Imagine we hadn't discovered the electron 120 years ago and there was no electronics. How would your life be different? You know, was magic gonna make up the, the answer is studying physics has given us incredible understanding of the world but also the ability to do many things in the world which we couldn't do before. And we made our lives as human beings much richer, but also we can do much more damage too. That's, there's, a, there's both sides to the coin. Uh, we'll I give a prize out for, for the physics today, you know. <laughs> I agree. I mean, I think uh, we live longer now, and everything starts, all the science sort of starts with physics to get all the way to the biology. And so it, I think it's an ethical question. People ask quite often, you know, should physics go down this path? Should it go down this path? But I think I trust that knowledge is always important to have. And then we also need our ethics to know when to use it and for what purpose to use it. But I, I don't think that's the question for the physicists. I think we want to understand how this universe works and take advantage of that. Uh, 
puedo correr? Venga. So, a general question now. So, number 19, which is from Santa Maria School in Portugalete. And it's a question for both our guests. <laughs> Did you ever think that your work would have a great impact on society? You want to be... Um, I was very lucky, I mean, as a graduate student I got to do this project and uh, you won't understand this, but when we go to conferences there's different sort of levels of, of speaking uh, and as a graduate student I was always given invited talks so I knew that the work that I had done, but I was in my fourth year of grad school so I had a, many, many failures until I got this success but uh, I knew it would be big for the field I could not imagine that it, how big it would be uh, for society in general, um, but, but, but I knew it was going to be big for my field of science. I was working hard in doing science because I wanted to know and I wanted to make my contribution to what is a huge across space and time collaboration to understand the world and to build things up. We have an amazing example of that in energy physics where thousands of people worked over decades to put together what we call a standard model which describes the universe in the microscopic detail unbelievably accurately. And I thought, well, I can do my part to be part of this declaration. And there was interest in the kind of stuff I was doing, and it got a little of attention, and that was kind of nice. But when we made the discovery, the, the discovery with the Kobe satellite, about the time there was the Kobe mascot for the Olympics in Spain, the, uh, the public attention was incredible and unbelievable. In Spain, it's before your time, but in Spain, it was spectacular. There was, you know, unbelievable interest and press coming to see us. I had a student who spoke Spanish, who was from Mexico, and he got to be the translator <laughs> to Spanish for what, 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 and he got invited to Spain to give many talks and to do many kinds of things. I got invited a number of times. And it, it was an overnight sensation, and that was in 1992, a long time ago. But he kind of it kind of never died away completely. And then the Nobel Prize came and it got huge again. And so it's, uh, it's not what I, I got back to doing research and doing stuff and then the Nobel Prize came and trashed it again. <laughs> Let's have a biographical question, number 73. From Jesuita in Dauchu in Bilbao, that's the name of the school, and it's a question for Donna Strickland. <laughs> Were you always sure that you would have the same chances of achieving your goals as a man? And did you always have the support of your friends and family in this process? And did you have their trust as well? She's asking her to repeat the question a little bit more slowly. She's asking the student to repeat the question more slowly. Uh, or because, I don't know, she's saying that the, we didn't translate the question, but did you understand the question? You understood the question. Oh, I'll read it again anyway. Were you always sure that you could have the same chances of achieving your goals as a man? Did you always have the support of your friends and family in the process and their trust? Perfect now, apparently, although she read it exactly the same speed. Um, yes, I always, uh, I never thought because I was a female, I would not have the same chance. In the 1970s, uh, certainly in North America, but I think around the world, women's lib was huge. There was a song by uh, Helen Reddy, I am woman, hear me roar. Um, my mother, 
uh, had wanted to do math when she was, went to university in the 40s and was told not to. And I grew up with her saying, don't ever let anybody tell you what to do. I would have been better off sticking with what I knew I should do and I should have done math instead of English. And, um, but also, or I went to undergrad, my classmates, who of course were male, uh, were always very good with me. Um, and uh, when I went to grad school, uh, the guys in the group were all, all uh, very good, and my supervisors have always been supportive. So I've been very fortunate in life in that every step of the way, uh, my friends uh, thought I belonged and, and never made a, a deal about it. A general question now. Seventy-two from Mendevaldea School in Vitoria Gasteiz, and the question is the following. To get where you are, in addition to making a great effort, have you had to give up other dreams and put aside the things you like? What were those dreams, and was it hard for you? Yes. <laughs> oh. But say jokes, say jokes. No, no, very short. <laughs> one of the things I love to do is travel, and I would say that science is a great one for travel. And so to me, I've blended probably the two things I like to do, and it's worked very well. Uh, but I also made time uh, when I did, uh, my children were young, I, I was home and had dinner with them, so I made sure that also happened. So I haven't, I don't feel like I've had to give up anything. You don't want to add anything else, no? You go with your yes. No, no, the answer is yes. You, if you're going to pursue something with vigor and enthusiasm and focus, you're going to give up doing other things. And the Nobel Prize comes along, it gives you great new opportunities, but it also takes away your ability to do certain other things. And so it's difficult when many people are young, their parents say they can do, you can do anything, implying you can do anything and everything. You know, but in fact, if you're going to do something really st stupendous and wonderful, it's going to require focus and hard work. A scientific question now? Number 41 from Ategorri School in Erandium. This is for Professor Smoot. Difficult. It's a good one. In your opinion? In your opinion, what was the breakthrough that can be considered the main milestone in the history of cosmology and what will be the most relevant discovery that will be made in the near future? <laughs> there are several things you can think about that were key discoveries in cosmology. The expansion of the universe by Hubble and his then formulation of the universal law expansion, the first law claimed to be absolutely universal on pretty meager data. I'll show you the data on Saturday if you want to come around and see that. And that is really spectacular uh, because building on the work of a famous woman astronomer, he first showed that the Andromeda galaxy was outside of our own galaxy. We didn't live in an island universe galaxy, and so on. He made these big strides, but there have been other strides. The discovery of the cosmic microwave background. You know, our team's discovery of the, of the anisotropy. Those things were major steps and tools forward. There are other things that we can point to. Um, our understanding the acceleration of the universe and of the dark matter, all of those are really major discoveries in cosmology, 
and have helped revolutionize our thinking. Are there going to be more? Yeah, the answer is there's probably one or two more big ones at least, but you don't know. Many fields go and then again, you know, long periods of consolidation. And so it's, it's the difficult to see. So if you ask what's the new discovery going to be, well, there's some I can point to that, we're going to, that are going to be interesting, but they may not change our view of the world or the universe, if you, if you want to think about it. So, you know, and what we think of a big, you know, a big advancement may be very different. Uh, as Donna was mentioning, our understanding of the real true nature of quantum mechanics and how good we can do in, in, in uh, quantum communications and so forth, and quantum cryptography and computing, those may have some prizes in them. So far, so good. However, you know, we don't understand the true nature of space-time. And one of the things that really excited me when we made a discovery was to realize we had the opportunity to discover the actual creation of space and time, what was the process and what was the energy scale for that. And we're getting close and we may make that or we may not, it depends. Sometimes you're lucky. We've been extremely lucky because the world turns out to be simple as it could be almost. I mean, it's the surprising. You would think if you ran everything together in a big pile, it's really going to get messy. Well, it doesn't, it gets easier. Otherwise, I couldn't understand the beginning of the universe, right? And we wouldn't be able to do that. There are things that happen that make it fortunate. Well, the world doesn't have to be that way. It can get complicated. So we have to see and see how, as human beings, we can make progress. So it's, it's a, you know, when I'm encouraging my students to think about what next project they're going to do, I had one of them, you know, in our, in our meeting say, you guys did all the easy stuff. And I had to tell him, it wasn't easy when we did it. <laughs> it's easy now that we've done it, and you can see how to do it. But it wasn't easy then. The stuff you're going to do now isn't going to be easy until you flip it over and see it a different way and make it happen. Fantastic. You know, you know, but... Um, there's nothing... I can add to the brilliant words that uh, Professor Smoot just said. But um, I will give you the opinion of um, Stephen Hawking, who uh, said that uh, Smoot's discovery and his team's uh, discovery of anisotropy was one of the main findings of the century and probably of all times in science. I paid him for that. <laughs> no, Stephen and I knew each other I, and so forth. And in return for his birthday, I noted Peter Diamandis and so forth. I got him a ride on the zero G airplane, oh, yeah. which was great because he could actually be free of his body and float around and do things like ordinary people. And uh, that was, you know, that was payback. <laughs> What do you think if we uh, now give the Telefonica a word? Would that be all right with you? Mr. Benito, please, can you join us up on the stage? Shall we give the prize now? All the questions have been wonderful. We really liked them. It was, it was very hard to pick just one. Um, but let's see who will be awarded this prize. Let's see, let's see. <laughs> You're too late for that. You should have sent it before, you know. Creo que la leerán ellos, pero para que digas cuál es, clica y aparecerá ya en la pantalla. Venga. Pues, eh, la pregunta premia. And the winner is question 134. No sé quién la tiene, pero... 
I don't know whose question this is, but please can you join me up on the stage? Thank you. Paula, muy bien. Pasa, pasa. Eh, dale tú adelante. Bueno, enhorabuena, eh, lo primero. Paula Manero, congratulations. And the question is, why if background radiation is isotropic, is the universe anisotropic? How is it possible to determine the limits of the universe and map its shape if it is expanding and can only be observed from within? There you go. <laughs> Very good. Actually, I like this question. I like this question so much, I give you a prize, too. <laughs> it's a very good question. And this is one of the things that motivated me, things that I wanted to know the answer to. And one of the things I wanted to know when I first started studying the microwave background was the universe rotating the universe seems to be expanding uniformly, but it could be rotating too. But you would see the rotation because around the equator, you would see the far away galaxies moving further away than near the poles, and you can make a measurement. And even if you can't see the end, you can see shear. It's like a, a river going like that. I had a student, the, the lovely Angelica, who, measured, who married, uh, another graduate student, Mark uh, Tegmark, and then they had children, they got to work. And she was from Brazil. However, we had a Spanish graduate student who was trying to come join my group because he was crazy for her in her eyes. Okay. And, but I had her do an experiment, a do study of what would it look like if the universe, instead of going forever, you know, had a finite thing. So imagine it was a cube the simplest possible thing. And you identify this edge with that edge, so that if you're a rocket ship, you go shh, right? How would that look? Imagine a cafe with tables and chairs and mirrors, and a big mirror is at the end and so forth. How would you tell if that cafe just stopped at the mirrors or kept going on or had a more complicated topology and came around in a circle? And the answer is, look at the rug. If there are ripples in the rug, and the ripples are longer than the cell unit of the thing, then the, it's at least as big as two cells or three cells or something. And so she did a study and said the universe has got to be bigger than 80% of the Hubble horizon, which is as far as you could possibly imagine to see because light can't get to us from, the, from that horizon. So the answer is, yeah, you can ask those questions, you can see it, and you can do it, and you can get a degree, and you can marry your husband and have children, and now she's head of a department. You, you can have a good career out of that, <laughs> and it's fun. Very good. It was a great question. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Whoa. You stand, you stand up for the beach. También para. Oh. Um, yes. You'd be in the middle, but you're handing the gift. Congratulations, Paula. Congratulations, Paula. Let's uh, now uh, move on. Uh, congratulations, Paula. The question was uh, wonderful, and so was the answer. Pedro, what do you think? Uh, shall we ask a general question now? Number 79. Abadiño. From Abadiño. This is for uh, Professor Smoot. They want you to work today, right? That's the trouble with the university. They want you to work all the time, yeah, teaching and researching. 
Who is your main scientific role model? That works. <laughs> so this is actually an interesting question that I had a different version of earlier. Of who was my best teacher? But a scientific role model is often a teacher. And I had had a series of role models. Uh, and I was very fortunate to have mentors and have role models around who were very good. And of course, when you're really young, it's like Madame Curie, you know, Einstein, these different kind of people. And then they get to be people you really get to meet, you know, and Fermi and so on. They get to be people who you meet. And I was, you know, asking Donna while well, we were having lunch the other day, I said, what was her experience when she signed the book? Right, and they first opened the, this book in the Nobel thing, to find, and they open it, and it's all these famous people, and they somehow always open to Einstein. <laughs> for physicists. <laughs> yes, the, for physicists. And, you know, these people were role models for us, but then you start to see real role models, people who, who hire you. One of my role models hired me to Berkeley was named Luis Alvarez. <laughs> A descendant from, from Spain, his father was a doctor at the Mayo Clinic, and he became a physicist, and he was extremely good and interesting in a lot of ways, and he, he taught one of the lessons, which is to do science, you have to have confidence in yourself, which you do, but you also have to know to check yourself. It's not enough to think, I can do this and get it right, and it's right. You do it, and then you say, where did I make a mistake? What can I check? What can I be sure of? How can I redo this? And this is a difference I sometimes see between men and women. A lot of the men are extremely sure they got it right, and they don't want to check. And a lot of women are not confident they can get it done, but they check carefully. And so in the end, the results are the same. But the process was very different. Now times are different. People have a different culture. So I had a series of role models, which were the classic physics role models, and then role models who were the previous generation. And it's handed down. There's now a genealogy of PhDs. You know, who was your, who was your thesis advisor? And who was his thesis advisor? So right back, in my case, right back to Galileo, right? It's, it's kind of amazing, right? And in mathematics, they have a complete genealogy. And so in physics, it's a partial genealogy. So, in fact, there's a lot of science that's handed down word to mouth, as well as what you learn in the books and the classes. Leonard, you want to say something? Okay, okay I'll just say one thing. Um, so I actually cite Maria Gopa Mayer in my PhD thesis, but when I uh, read the paper that I cited, I did not know uh, that it even that she was a woman. I just assumed, because the paper was written in 1931, that it was a man. And it was a, one of the people that read my thesis went, shame on you, Donna, and stroked out the he and wrote she. Because I just said, I'm Gabriel Mayer, blah, blah, blah. He did whatever. And um, so then later on, I, I read, she was featured in a magazine article in this optics uh, journal. And I read about how she had to um, just follow her husband, who was a chemist, and got good jobs at good places, but she did not get paid to be a scientist until she was in her 50s and working at Argonne National Lab. And I just thought that's amazing that she would take secretarial jobs so they would give her an office and then she would still do her theoretical physics just for the sheer fun of it, even though she did have children and, and everything. Um, and so to me, I just thought that is so amazing that somebody loves doing her physics so much that she would just be doing it just for the sheer fun of it. And uh, so, so in a way, she became my role model, even though I didn't know she was a woman to start with. <laughs> Whatever. OK. OK, let's carry on now. A scientific question, number 63, from Miguel School. Circuito fornico a circuito. 
Do you think that photonic circuits will be more widely used than electronic ones in the future? Uh, okay, so, uh, and I've been known to say, because this is one of the things that we say in uh, Optica, is that uh, photonics is the technology for the 21st century, like electronics was uh, for the 20th century. Uh, optical computing comes and goes, okay, so it, it rises up, it comes down, it's maybe rising up again. Uh, I think there's a big push right now for silicon photonics. I don't know that it will be um, the one that does the calculations. What I will say is that most people don't realize that in a data center, right, there's millions of lasers there. Uh, the, the electrons maybe do the calculations still, or the atoms with the electrons still do the calculation, but the information is always carried by photons because they don't have mass. And so you really can't have one without the other. And even though the superconducting type of um, quantum computer is right now winning in the number of uh, qubits they can have, uh, the information still has to be uh, delivered with photons. So it's always going to be a big part of the player of any kind of uh, computer. It's just not necessarily the one that will do the calculation. Okay, maybe now a general question, number 59. And it's a question that comes from ASC Fatima in Bilbao. And it's for both our guests. Come. What has been the biggest challenge that you have ever faced? I'll start. Uh, obviously, uh, I think one of the biggest things about being a female scientist is that this will change as there gets to be more female scientists, but when there were so few, it was too easy for us to find a male partner uh, within science. <laughs> and so most females are scientists are, are partnered with male scientists. And so we have what's known in physics as the two-body problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been the toughest thing, is that I actually at one point gave up on my scientific career and became a technician at Princeton because my husband had his dream job at Bell Labs. And then he's followed me at home to Canada and keeps wondering when it's his turn again. So uh, this has been one of the biggest challenges, that we can't both be working in our dream jobs at the same time. Okay, so I have one that's obvious because many people know about it. And that is when we were designing the COBE satellite, Cosmic Background Explorer, but COBE for the mascot, um, it took a long time because we got in the queue. It was proposed to be a small satellite, but then some people got kicked off of another satellite that was done at the same time. And they decided they wanted to keep them because they were favorites. And they put us into a bigger satellite. And that slowed us down because we got in the queue behind the other satellites that were gone forward. So it took extra years. And as we we're getting ready to finally go, go towards launch, there was a disaster with the shuttle. And NASA grounded this entire fleet. And so we were looking at a situation where the launch opportunities were going to be zero for some years. And yet I had developed this team, and we were building our equipment, and we were testing it. And it was pretty much ready to go. And so what were we going to do? And I actually came over to Europe and tried to convince the European Space Agency to launch us, right? To redo it and launch us. And that made NASA a little upset at me, but I wasn't a NASA employee like the other people that, that were, were in there. And so they, but they realized that we were going to do it, <laughs> whether they wanted to do it or not. We were going to try because someone was so crazed. And so they said, all right, you're going to be a test case. We're going to make you rebuild your equipment 
that is my team had to rebuild our equipment. The center guys got this thing and saying, and we're gonna put you on a regular rocket, the old fashioned rocket instead of the, the wonderful new shuttle, which wasn't so wonderful. And we were one of the first satellites to be launched like that after that situation. And you know, the rest became history. I've actually had that happen a second time. Uh, don't ever do a satellite with the Russians, no matter what anybody says. Do not ever do a satellite with the Russians. It is the worst deal. <laughs> and <laughs> so it can be worse, but there are challenges. As a researcher, you have to overcome challenges, even if they're really big and awful. So, 117 from Chorieri Institute, and it's a question for both of our guests. Do you think that we will ever live on another planet? And if so, when will that happen? <laughs> I don't think that's more for you than me. But, um, <laughs> we do I we should, so? they should ask Didier. Isn't he supposed to be here today? <laughs> yeah, really. Um, I think it'll be very hard uh, for us to get to another planet because it's not really close by, although George's going to tell you it's only four years away. Um, it won't be in my lifetime. Not for humans. <laughs> it won't be in my lifetime. I don't know about uh, your lifetime, but I would think not. Um, and the, and the, you know, the one thing, even sending people uh, to Mars and back, right? And, and this question came up on a different panel that I was on. And what if something goes wrong and you need to talk to a, a surgeon maybe back on Earth, you know? It takes eight minutes just to have the information go back and forth. So there's a lot to consider other than just knowing that there's life or possibility of life somewhere else uh, to move that far away. Okay, so I have a personal prejudice here. I think it's possible we may eventually have life on other planets in our solar system. And only if we think it's the most important thing the human race can do, will we try and have humans go to an extrasolar planet. And the only way that makes sense is to freeze fertilized eggs, <laughs> freeze them completely and surround them with radiation shielding and everything else, and send them a long way with robot nannies, right? You might as well just send the robots. I mean, you only bring in the humans to contaminate the planet. It's like, it takes a lot of resources to have a human. You can turn a robot off and then turn them back on later. It just makes so much more sense to send our AI systems than it does to send humans. But if you wanna, it'd take half the GDP of the world for about a thousand years and you can do it. <laughs> Graphical question now, number 65 from IES Minas School in Baracaldo. The question is for Professor Smoot. When you started working on the Kobe project, did you ever think you would make such a significant discovery? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> How? So this is actually why I chose to move from my original PhD in studying particle physics and understanding how the world works microscopically to studying cosmology. I knew eventually the snake has to bite its tail to make osaburas, that the, the absolute biggest things have to be related to the smallest things. And that if we understood the universe on the biggest scale or the smallest scales, it was going to be very similar. So I realized there were thousands of people doing particle physics, but there were only a few people doing cosmology. Therefore, no matter what I did, as long as I did my research well, it was going to be important, and it was going to be exciting, and I would make a major contribution. 
that I could build my own team and make a major contribution. That's the situation you look for. That's why my students said, you did all the easy things. Well, it wasn't so easy. You know, it's like going out to the west part of the United States in 1600 <laughs> and trying to, you know, see where the ocean is, right? It's, um, it, it, I knew that there, there had to be something that was, and that's because I actually am in my heart a physicist. I used to teach introductory physics to non physics people, and I actually, in Berkeley, I changed the name of the course to Physics for Future Congressmen, and my successor changed to Physics for Future Presidents. Unfortunately, one of our presidents didn't take it. <laughs> and, and, but you have to understand science in the modern days, but you have to understand that in science, you believe there's an external reality, and you believe that all common observers observing the same experiments will see the same net results. That there isn't a subjective you know, thing. But you also have to know that humans are incredibly fallible as observers. The humans have to check themselves and double check themselves. There's not an accident in medicine you do double blind studies because even blind studies give, get wrong results because People are very susceptible. They pick up whether the doctor has a fiction. So I had confidence that the universe was real and that the universe obeyed actual laws. The thing that I took the gamble on was that the universe would stay simple early. General question now. Number 87, uh, sent in by Icharo Pena School, and it's for everyone. Well, everyone, it's for both our guests. I think Pedro should have to answer. <laughs> what, what, was the what was the question? It's coming now. The question, they're going to read it now. So and the question is, what do you think of the pressure that is put on scientists to publish papers? Do you think this is causing an increase in scientific fraud? Good question. Good question. I, I think it has become a real problem uh, in my day. Uh, we did not even know what our citation counts were because you, you couldn't readily get this information. Right? We had to go to a library, there was a big book, you'd have to look through this big book once a year, it would come out. No, there's nobody that I know bothered ever to do that. Um, I will tell you that the paper that I published that won me the Nobel Prize, I don't think was cited for the first two years. So by all of today's um, ways of looking at it, I didn't publish it in a high impact journal and I, you know, I would have just been a total abject failure by today's standards. Um, and so I, I think because it's become so easy to have these numbers and attach these numbers, and it's much easier to judge people if we just have to look at these numbers, that we've um, lost control a little bit about really being able to judge what is good science and, and what isn't good science. And I think we really, as a whole scientific society, have to figure out better ways uh, to start doing this because it's not just the scientific fraud that seems to be being propelled possibly by this. I just think all the hiring and everything about it, we're judging on these very strange things now. Okay, this is something I'm actually upset about, and I got upset about it enough to uh, give some of my colleagues a lot of trouble. So as I said, with some of my colleagues from DIPC and from Hong Kong, we were doing work with the James Webb Telescope. The James Webb Telescope, uh, and I argue with Adam Rees about this, who's another Nobel laureate for the discovery of the accelerating universe. Um, they decided to release, whenever they release a picture, they release the data. And NASA likes to release a picture every week. It's usually Tuesday, they, do, you know, they have a certain day of the week, they release it, and you know the next day in the paper there'll be some wonderful things about what the telescope, Hubble or JWST was discovering. And they released the data. And their decision was, they released that data 
because they didn't want to show that they were favoring anybody. They let anybody have access to that data. This made me disturbed for two reasons. One, because we have a graduate student, another graduate student, and a postdoc directly on our team, one here, one in Hong Kong, and uh, another postdoc who will be here, who's here now, and another one's coming soon. And we were trying to teach them to how to do the science carefully and review the stuff and do it. And the, there are people who are just rushing yeah. results out, including people that found a worm, a galaxy with a giant wormhole in it, and then it's published you know, a week after the picture was done. I mean, it, it, it made me very upset. And then it turned out one of the members of our own team, um, who I wasn't paying attention to because I wasn't going to the pull-up team meetings, only the local meetings, decided he could do a really quick study and see these very early galaxies. And he wrote up a paper, and he sent it out to a bunch of people on the team and said, you want your name on this or not? Uh, and they sent it in, and sent it in, right? Very little review, very little whatever it is. And one of our colleagues who was on the, our weekly Zoom calls signed the paper. One of our colleagues who here at UPV and the NPC did not sign. He got in a fight and said, this is not good enough. So I give credit to him. And anyway, I'm reading right back to the guy. How, you know, authorship means you stand behind this paper. He said, eh, I put my name on it because I didn't want to cause trouble. And I know the reviewers will cook it out. Well, if you actually look, 30% of the papers about with James Webb Telescope's data have been retracted. Yeah. Some after publication, some before publication. I think this is the tip of the iceberg because we hadn't had time to talk about this, but AI is being used more and more by students and by researchers. <laughs> and the AI doesn't necessarily have the judgment to realize what it's saying is really wrong. So I think we're going to see terrible controversy and until we teach our students that if you have your name on the paper, there are four important things that you must, you know, you must have written stuff there. You must take credit, for, you, know, you must take responsibility for everything that's in that paper. And so on, there's a list of things that must be before you're an author on a paper. And people haven't been teaching that to young people. So being a scientist isn't just going and do stuff. You have responsibilities to the fabric of science to keep it honest and to check against the people who are in a rush to get a, make a name for themselves. So I got really upset about this. I read in the riot act to my colleagues at the University of Paris, you know, at the, at the, at the Astroparticle Cosmology Group and, and said, look, we have to start doing this kind of thing. It's, it is a real issue. Part of it is publication pressure. Part of it is people just want their name in the paper. Right? There are people who are doing science blogs, right? just like they, they do Me Too's <laughs> videos, and the people putting the greatest, latest science out. Right? And how, how is a high school student going to know what's real science and what's not? But, you <laughs> tengo una pregunta para los dos. I've got a question for both of you. Now, you've said that we need to teach our students to be responsible, but do we only have to teach students? What about lecturers? What about teachers? Because there are a lot of teachers who sign papers knowing full well that they probably shouldn't be doing that. Who here is not a student? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. You're a student? Yeah. Donna's a student. I'm a student. They're no, all but, students. But this, yes, we have a responsibility for even our most senior colleagues. Yeah, but uh, when you were referring, we must to teach the students, I was worried that uh, many professors will do well learning also that. No? Yes, um, they're students too. <laughs> <laughs> no, but not because of that. <laughs> I mean, I actually learned this lesson uh, very early on in that uh, when I wrote my very first paper, the one I won the Nobel Prize for, I put the colleague's name who helped me take the final data on the paper. And um, he then said, no, you've worked really hard on this. Don't let anybody else take credit away from how much time you've done. I don't deserve to be on this paper. 
and he took his name off. And so I just always took that as a big lesson that if you haven't really made a big contribution to the paper, yeah. you really you know you can be an acknowledgement at the end, but you shouldn't be uh, a main uh, person. And so I've taken that to heart. And I'll also say, and I'm sure George has gotten this a lot, that once you win the Nobel Prize, everybody tentatively connected to you wants your name on their paper. They think it probably helps boost their paper, maybe. And so. Um, you know, and I have to keep saying, no, I have this, this rule that I have to uh, have really contributed to the paper in order to be on the paper. Hello. Hello, Mr. Gimbal. How are we doing for time? Quite well. We have uh, 15, 20 minutes left, maybe. So we still have uh, some more questions for you. So, 15 more minutes and then we go for the summary of this session. Yes, is that all right with you? Yes, and we take a picture. Okay. So, let's now ask a scientific and technical question. Just pick it at random. Okay. <laughs> Just random. Push, the, push the question button. <laughs> So I will go with science this time. 62. Number 62 from Miguel de Unamuno School in Vitoria Gasteiz. And you can all answer it. This is a question for both. What was the turning point of the research that led you uh, to your Nobel Prize and when did you feel it was special? Do you want me to go first? Yes. Um, okay, so the turning, uh, the turning point for what led to our Nobel Prize really, uh, Gerard had the idea the year before I started working on it, but he did not know how to do it. And so I will say that this is what's maybe not so known because a few of us get named, but it takes a whole village to get science to work. And so uh, the thing that's made us start working on it was the fact that it was becoming very big in the field of short pulse lasers to do pulse compression of these type of laser called neodymium YAG laser. And it was a pulse that was roughly 100 picoseconds and a picosecond is a millionth of a millionth of a second. And they were compressing down to roughly one picosecond. And when we saw this at the one conference, it was like, wow, that's how we do it. All we have to do between the fiber stretcher and the compressor is put our amplifier in and we have CPA. And so I remember the group meeting right there at the conference with it. It was like, oh my gosh, we've got to do it. We've got to do it now because everyone's going to see the way to do it. That wasn't true. <laughs> it was only because we were already thinking about how to do it that we saw it. But um, it, was, it was other people's work that was the turning point. So I'm missing the translation for some reason, but I, I will answer a question. <laughs> what, what's so, the turning point? Of no, the, which, which was the turning point? Which was the turning point for you? That it was something different, something really important uh, online. It oh, was, was a particular moment. A this, point. Is, this is really difficult to answer because not only were they working on the Kobe satellite for eventually two decades, okay, so um, longer than you students have been alive that I was working on this satellite, having the idea, making the design, getting the approval from NASA, building the apparatus, the team that knew how to, to operate it and calibrate it, and then finally taking the data and then analyzing the data and so on. So I knew whatever we found was gonna be important because you can look at the problem is how did the stars come into being? They had to go through the fireball. Imagine the whole universe is as hot as the sun uniformly everywhere, and you threw the sun in it. What would happen? Sun is gone. So why are there suns? Why are there stars? You knew something, studying this radiation carefully, was going to tell us something about the universe. The question was, what's it going to tell us? 
And so there's a turning point when we start to realize we see these variations, and these variations seem to be independent of scale, and these variations um, have all these unusual kind of properties, and uh, they don't look quite right. And in fact, they still don't look quite right, but they look pretty right. And at that point, I realized that this crazy idea of inflation has got to be right, and that we understand how space and time is being made, but does our data support that or does it not support that? And actually, when we made the announcement, we invited Alan Guth and Paul Steinhardt and some other people to come to the announcement because we knew it was going to change their lives too, right? It's the, because they were the architects of the different models. And, play. and uh, it was, uh, you know, it, it was a slow realization that this incredible model of what's happening in a tiny fraction of a second told us what the embryo universe was going to look like, and then the embryo universe told us what the rest. So, yeah, but the real thing was, we, give, we finally give our talks and present this publicly, and the American Physical Society says, okay, we're going to arrange a press conference for you. And we're there at a press conference, and there are as many reporters as there are students asking questions, right? And they go, wow. And they started saying, put this in terms we can understand, right? Not, you know, you found all this complicated structure with this. It's like you were a doctor operating in an emergency room, and they bring a patient in, and you start cutting on them, and you look down, and it's your son or your daughter. You, <laughs> you feel differently about cutting them up, even though you shouldn't, you do. And that's when I really understood the implication for the rest of the world, but I understood intellectually, wow, I know something about the universe everybody else does, and I get to share it with them. <laughs> that was the thrill. That's, you know, only happened like three times in my life that I made discoveries that I knew were special and got to do that. But I wasn't ready for the press that happened. That press is the only thing that's kind of like getting the Nobel Prize where you have an incredible, there was press that was unbelievable it was the people doing the, you know, there were newspapers in those days instead of, <laughs> instead of electronic stuff. And there was all the stuff going on. And then there were the, period, the weekly periodicals, the monthly They all came and interviewed you one after another on TV, all the stuff. And it was like, they knew it was big, whatever. And the thing that really was amazing to me was the editors of the Washington Post, which is the number, there are two really important newspapers in the United States apologized to the reporters for not putting the story above the fold. It was on the front page of the Washington Post, but it was below the fold. <laughs> and the reporters were telling, this story is so big, you've got to put it above the fold. It's more important than, you know, so-and-so being caught doing stuff in Congress, right? <laughs> Fantastic. And so it's hard for me to say, when did it hit me? Because it's different between knowing it intellectually and knowing it in your, you know, in your spirit. Shall we ask one more question? Because I've got a few questions myself. Is that all right with you? Yes, okay. We're doing well for time anyway. Maybe one more uh, general question? Not finished. I have one more. Personally, I want to, I mean, to use the privilege of being the moderator to have a question. Okay. So after we've... the next one. Okay, so let's do this one. Okay. It is a general question. A general question then, number 44. From um, Mungia School, and this one goes for Professor Smoot. For everyone. <laughs> How come me? <laughs> I'm afraid of your question. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Have you ever felt fear of the unknown? I, I always have curiosity about the unknown. 44. And, and uh, you know, sometimes you have a little caution and you don't stick your hand in the jaw of the tiger until you've poked him with a stick or something. But 
you know, I want to know stuff. I want to know how things are going and what happens. And so I, I always think that even if it's kind of scary, you should still try and understand it and see what's going on. But you should be careful, too. Uh, OK, I'll, I'll answer, too. I, I think one of the disservice we do to the field of science is that until you're in grad school, uh, we teach science about it being all the stuff that's been learned before, and we have to learn all of the science that we've learned before. But doing science is about not knowing. That's what, that's what doing science is about. We don't know something, and we want to, to know that. And so uh, if we didn't have an unknown, there would be no reason for science. Uh, that's what it's all about. And so I think it is wondering uh, why something is working the way it is or why the universe is the way it is and not knowing it. And so scientists have to be very open to the fact that we don't know most things. So well, well, my question is uh, for both of you. And it's been motivated by a, something I read from Smoot. And my question is, why are there some branches of science that uh, focus on one thing and have uh, boundaries with others? For instance, with your discovery, uh, George, um, I read that you had seen in this anisotropy, you had seen the footprint of God, right? And the face of God? Okay, then. The face of God. Oh, the Dios and sus preocupaciones. Astrophysicians often talk about God. And uh, in the biomolecular field, this happens less, right? To a, fewer, to a lesser extent. So this concern about uh, transcending, where does it have its roots and origins? Does it have with uh, contact with other branches of knowledge and humanities? Because uh, science is part of the human, uh, or the modern humanism. And it is closely related to astrophysics. God doesn't play uh, dance with the universe, you know. It's not a molecular biologist who said that. What do you think about that? George, Donna. Donna first or me? You first. Okay. Because you are... You, you first, yeah, George. It's, it's funny because it's evidence that reporters often get their job wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and they weren't prepared. They were, there were not many science reporters in those days, so a room this many reporters in it had a lot of people who were social page or sports reporters or whatever. They weren't qualified to, to do this. And so when they, when they were having that great evidence, and as I said, they want me to put it in terms that their average the average reporter and person could understand. I gave an example that it's the largest structures and they're this unbelievably humongous and this kind of stuff and there and so forth. And then this is important and it tells you what's going to happen. And finally, one of the things I said, this is so amazing. It's like if you were religious, if it was, it's just, if you were religious, it would be like seeing God. That reported in, in about a third of the newspaper, he's seen the face of God. <laughs> and the brothers Bogdanov, who used to be famous in France, used that as evidence for God <laughs> and had a, a big program on TV, a TV program that series that went on for some, some months, you know, saying about it was. It's, it's a, uh, it's a problem of using an analogy. If you have a complicated science thing and you try and explain it to the public with analogies and the people who are doing it still don't know what, what's going on, they're gonna get some, some kind of stuff. But there is, there is somehow an instinct, you know, a, um, an instinct that when you start talking about the creation of the universe, to bring God in. I don't know why. The, the head of the, the Ray Weiss, who got the Nobel Prize more recently, was chair of our science working group. And after it's done, he takes the pipe out of his mouth and says, I wish the hell he hadn't said that. <laughs> and I, I said, does he see the irony in what he just said? But it's, 
But you have to look at science and realize that science made progress in the early days because people focused in on narrow areas. And the progress of science has been joining these narrow areas and unifying them. So we had system mechanics and we had thermodynamics, right? And we have thermal physics, right? And it unifies. And so, so we have this whole set of unifications that have been going on. And we think that physics, you know, atomic physics, quantum mechanics, and communications, and biology are all related, right? We think it's DNA and it's, and there's, it's, it's a molecular machine that does quantum mechanics makes all these things happen. All these things are, are united, whereas in the old days, you know, it was a question of the, if you cut off a puppy dog tail and put it in the mud, would it make a new puppy dog or something? It's, you know, it's a, it's a wholly different kind of view that you're beginning to unify the fabric of science. Right? Well, I think, uh, first of all, it, it got written up uh, that I do go to church, and so then I've had to answer this question. I also go to a very liberal church where you can believe anything, uh, and I didn't realize, and so in answer to your question, somebody who wanted to um, write about this said to me, uh, you know, Newton was looking for God's code in the universe, and that's where it is in physics, but there are as many biologists looking for God's code in the very complicated um, biology and, the, and how complicated the DNA and everything is. Uh, I personally think if God wanted to tell us something, uh, he could make it a whole lot easier. So uh, I, don't, I don't really wait, think wait, God's writing add. really complicated code that we're trying our best to see. Uh, I think you could say, I'm right over here. Um, and so I, I don't think that's what it is. And, and I, I really don't think that science even questions that. I just think that science really, we've been given the universe. Whether God gave us the universe or not, uh, we were given this universe to understand and, it's, and, and we live in it so we want to understand it. Uh, and so th that's all there is to it. I think we're just trying to understand it the best we can. I got more. I can add more. <laughs> I can add more here. Okay, so, the, uh, if we go into the history of science, there was a time period when the church was running things very carefully, and the people who were doing scientists, you know, they started doing study of, of light and of understanding why light took the minimum or the, you know, the stationary path through that. And the argument they were making in the church, this is understanding God. Yes. This is understanding you know, we're studying light and God is light and so on and so forth. Because people had to justify why they were studying the thing when, when you know, there are certain people think that certain religious books have all the information you need. There's, there's at least two, lang two religions that hold this very strongly and so forth. So it, it's kind of hard to see. Uh, I had a wonderful experience. I got invited to the 400th anniversary of Galileo to uh, the Vatican for a conference and to give a talk in the conference. And they had Galileo's original books because they put them on trial. <laughs> and he had to turn in all his publications. And they're beautiful. I mean, the books are beautiful. And they brought them out for this anniversary. So. But the thing that was going on was the crisis of confidence among the philosophers and the religious people because for centuries there had been more people doing philosophy, but even more people doing religion, and yet science was coming up big and strong and powerful. How, how is it possible that in the modern world, science is something that people respect and look at where religion and philosophy are kind of ignored? It's going back the other way there, George, so don't Yeah, worry. well, there's, there's, there are waves, right? So you, you understand, but it's very clear if you're studying the world, there's a huge amount of stuff out there to study. If you're studying the scriptures, there's not so much to study. New ideas are much harder to come by in those fields. Right, so just to finish, maybe uh, I can just give you a brief summary, more brief, briefer than usual. I've had a privilege 
to, uh, to, of sharing all the different encounters with students, that all of them, every single one that we've held, right from the very beginning. We started back in 2005. Idoya, if I've got that wrong, please tell me. But it's been a long time. But it's, I really am very, very grateful. First of all, to the teachers. All of you here, all you teachers here today, thank you so much. You've worked with your students. They've sent in some fantastic questions. I mean, they're fantastic. The questions were amazing. They're really impressive. They really will make anyone think, not just us. And I think the answers, I think there can be no doubt that they're very well, brilliant, fantastic, wise answers, but they're not the only answers. There are other answers that are possible. We've also seen that the, our two guests, these two leading scientists, they're both very optimistic. There seems to be a kind of general pessimism out there in the world, but they still think that the world can be understood. They have faith that if we work hard, we can understand the world. And as well as this objective knowledge, something good will come out of this objective knowledge. Of course, there'll be problems along the way. There'll be shortcomings and shortfalls, and there'll be problems along the way. That's just the eternal duality of science. But they do believe that questions have answers, and that if we work hard, we can get to know the world. And that's great to hear. But I think that the most important message that is being conveyed today is that we have two leading scientists who are here, and they're normal people. They've got problems in their lives. They've enjoyed parts of their lives. They've got a really good sense of humor. And uh, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe if, if George Schmutz sends in a, a really good question, he might get an iPad from Telefonica. That's what they were joking about beforehand. So they're normal people. And if you work hard, you can be like them. There's nothing stopping you. They never thought they were going to win a Nobel Prize. They weren't working towards that goal. They were just working hard. They enjoyed what they do. And things have gone well for them. And things will go well for you if you work hard as well. Thank you very much to all of you. Good positive note. Eh? So, thank you very much, Pedro, for those uh, words. Thank you, Professor Strickland, Professor Smooth. Thank you to all of you as well. Thank you for that, those fantastic questions that you sent in. So, as I was saying, in what we're missing now is a picture that we're going to take all together outside, and then we will have a break for coffee and for what we call amaike taco, which is literally the thing that we eat at 11. And since it's... 20 past 11, I think we're right there, so we can go for a Maike Taco together and do the, the general picture. Thanks again to everyone. Thanks to Donna Stickland, George Moots, and Pedro Chenique. Askeneko Chaloa, venga. A last round of applause for all of them, please.